Okay. Oh, I guess I better stay up here now. So <laughs> Yeah, I did. Well, it's all my whole career, basically. Yeah. 11 years now at West. Okay, we're getting ready to start our current events thing. And I always start off by telling everybody how we started doing this. 24th annual meeting. At our second annual meeting, Hal Lindsey came and spoke on Tuesday night. And he gave a paper. And after he delivered his paper, everybody started asking me questions about current events. And so, uh, we started doing current events on Tuesday nights because we believe that our view of prophecy being the futurist view actually relates to history and we believe that we're seeing um, the preparation for the events that take place after the rapture. Now Dr. Walvard who attended up until the year he died here, every year, used to say, when you're in the mall and you see decorations of Christmas, you know that Thanksgiving is near. <laughs> because the rapture is signless, you can't date her. I asked her out for a date and she said, I don't date. <clears throat> and. Therefore, there are no signs for the rapture, right? And the reason why is because we're to be waiting and watching at any moment. Always. If there were signs, you'd be looking for the signs, right? But Christ could come at any moment. But after he comes, then there are hundreds of events that are going to take place after the rapture and then on into the tribulation. And in Matthew 24, it says that when you see this, the end is not yet. We're talking about early things in the tribulation period. Then you see this, the, the abomination of desolation, the end is not yet. And then it says, when you see this, talking about the second coming, then look up for your redemption draws near. So you can see the signs leading up to the second coming. So we can develop a framework of people, places, and things like that, and we're seeing that uh, the stage is being set and prepared for this. And I think a basis for that is 2 Thessalonians 2, which says the mystery of iniquity, referring back to the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is already at work. In other words, throughout the church age. Only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So. There's an upper limit of what God, the Holy Spirit's going to allow uh, preparation to be, but it, that passage also implies or says that there is preparation or Satan is trying to move history in the direction of setting up for the tribulation period, you see. So I think that gives us uh, a justification for looking at current events as they may be leading us toward that. So tonight we're going to have Wilfred Hahn, and he is an international banker, or was an international banker, right? That's not the way you'd like it put, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yes, but he was uh, in charge in Canada of one of the, at the largest uh, bank investment group or something like that, and I believe you said last time you spent half of your time over in Europe hanging out with those people. He's got a real grasp of the international banking system and economic stuff and he has some really good insights into what's happening. And last time he showed us that the whole world, even Switzerland, is locked into this international banking system which we believe, you know, at some point will be used by the Antichrist 
uh, <clears throat> to prevent people from buying and selling. And so he's going to talk to us about uh, these kinds of things. So, Wilfred. Well, thank you, Tommy. Uh, again, a privilege to be here and uh, to speak again at the current events. Um, I'm a Canadian, you probably know, and the sad thing I have to report is that uh, we just lost our pro-Zionist prime minister. I don't even following that. Uh, whereas once Canada was one of the very, very few pro-Zionist countries, even to the point of getting kicked off the Security Council, or at least not having had the opportunity to serve on the uh, revolving Security Council at the UN. Uh, now we got a new prime minister, and um, he hasn't made any pronouncements just yet, but uh, it's not going to be nearly as pro-Zionist as before, and I hope it's not going to get real ter terrible. But anyway, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And I um, just want to say a couple things about, about uh, what I'm going to present and hear my background. I did, we did circulate a newsletter that our ministry puts out called Eternal Value Review. Uh, it is available free. Um, please look at the, find the, uh, the web address there and you can go to it and sign up. I'll, I'll tell you, it's, going to, it's a very different letter. It's probably the only dispensationalist global macroeconomic publication <laughs> out there. But we do try to tie together what's going on in the world today, uh, the accelerating patterns that we see and tying it into scripture and how it all fits in over the long term. And that's what I want to do here a little bit as well. Uh, Tommy already gave me a little bit of an introduction. Maybe I'll just give you a little bit more of a background. Uh, I was a director of research for a Wall Street firm for some time, already many years ago. And then as uh, Tommy already mentioned, I was chairman of uh, the investment oper global investment operations of Royal Bank of Canada, which is the largest bank, uh, large even in American terms. And at that, in those days, I traveled a lot internationally. And um, I picked up some Dave Hunt books at some point early in my career. <laughs> And I was radicalized. <laughs> and I might, I might add, a lot of authors I read from the Pre-Trib Research Council, and they had a great influence on me. And uh, just what I was observing around the world just seemed to, to put some of the Bible prophecy to, to life for me. And so that was the start of our ministry, and ever since then, my career's been downhill. <laughs> Being exposed as a dispensationalist economist. Anyhow, let's, uh, we've got lots to cover here, current events, and uh, I want to talk about a number of things, but first I want to just condition you, as I did last year, uh, if you want that presentation from last year, you'll have to go to the Timothy LaHaye uh, website, I guess, and uh, order that, and I did more of a foundational perspective on how the whole globe is evolving. Today I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk to some specific issues, uh, but I do want to just take a moment to set the foundation here, why money, economy, all that sort of thing is associated with, with prophecy and is spoken about in the Bible. Uh, economies are human, right? And uh, so if there weren't humans, there wouldn't be economies in the financial market, so it obviously has to be all tied in. But the Bible does speak about, just a couple of quick points, a deep commercialism prophecy does tell us about. Uh, the world will be driven by a common idolatry of money and commerce, a number of references in the Bible there. Uh, economic oppression and wealth distribution disparities worldwide. We see some reference to that made in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. These are all prophesied things, and again, as you can see, they're related uh, to money and commercialism. Deep indebtedness of governments. I think uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 7 does prove that. And uh, trends through globalism, globalization, and post-globalism, the, th the period that I think we're going to be up against here pretty soon, and there's many, many references to that in the Bible. And lastly, I just want to point out, and this is the big, big boogaboo for everybody uh, in the world who has to deal with financial markets in some respect, we're in a time of pervasive corruption, immoral policy, and that period of lying and stealing uh, that Zechariah talks about in chapter 5. So that sets a little bit of a tone here for uh, where we're coming from with a biblical perspective now as we turn to talk about some of the things going on in the world right now. It literally is a hotbed right now uh, of, of change. And as I call it, what's failure in political economics uh, is rapidly driving uh, this humanist world towards its outcome in the tribulation period. Some really, truly phenomenal uh, transitions are occurring. Even myself, who's been in that field uh, for almost 40 years, when I see what is happening and how quick 
I myself as a researcher and analyst can't even believe it. Uh, policymakers around the world are confused. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit and how that has an impact on everyone uh, as they're dealing with some very asymmetric policy risks. And the one thing I want to point out here, uh, none of my presentation is meant to you know, cause a fear mongering. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm just wanting to explain what's happening and I'm not here to sell gold or anything else like that. We're just, you know, we're going to just talk about uh, the, the, what's happening in the world and try to put a biblical perspective on it. So uh, don't fear, relax. You can go, you don't have to hold on to your purse. Um, we're just going to focus on the facts here. First thing I want to talk about, a very interesting one is China. Um, everybody must be aware that uh, a lot of things are going on in China. So I want to dive into that because I think there's always a, also a biblical perspective we want to talk about. Now have a look at that picture. That is Shanghai in 1970. Now here, look at it now. I'm going to go, I'll do that one more time. So I'll go back to the previous one. And so that's a little more than 40 years. Uh, what has gone on in China is, it is really unbelievable and I think it's not it was not chance, and there's some interesting uh, motives behind it, agendas behind it. So let's talk about it. Uh, here's a research outfit that uh, uh, we subscribe to, and uh, just listen to this statement. We believe that the single most important macro trend of our time, China's attempt to transform itself from a typical emerging market into an empire. That's the biggest thing that's going on right now, and certainly from where I sit, uh, that is true. The Napoleon Bonaparte's um, Prediction way back when, turn of the 1800s, uh, said when China wakes, it will shake the world. And we're indeed that period of time right now, and I'm going to show you uh, what's happening. Uh, I'll just, to, oops, sorry about that, touch on some things that have happened recently. You know, for a long time, China has slumbered, but all of a sudden, since the late 1970s, just erupted on the world stage. Lately, some of the things that have happened that are quite significant, I'll just point out. It just joined, uh, it's just in the process of joining the world stock market indices. Uh, to this point, you know, the Chinese stock market has been, you know, a lot like what uh, a Middle East map would look like. Uh, it hasn't had Israel on it. And that's how institutional investors look at China. If you're not in the map, if you're not in the indices, they're not going to invest in that country. So that's what's happened here recently. They're going to be part of that. It's amazing how large the uh, Chinese stock market already is. They've just recently gained recognition in the IMF and now part of the special drawing reserve, or right, pardon me. Um, so they're part of that uh, IMF uh, hit, um, international structure. And it's interesting that they already got granted that status, because I think the IMF was definitely rushing it. Um, China, in response to some of the um, hindrances, if you will, of the US against some of the initiatives of the IMF just a number of years ago, finally said, Look, we're going to start a parallel world ourselves. Recently, they launched the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and 56 countries in the world signed up. So this is a competing system to the World Bank IMF group, uh, sort of Western-based countries. That's happened just recently. It's very, very significant. Very interesting as well, China is working very, very hard to build a network. Um, they already are the manufacturing hub of Asia overall. But they're working very hard to try to connect all these um, countries out in Asia through what they call the Silk Road Marine Belt Initiative. We're going to talk about that a bit, but it is very, very significant. Uh, so many things are going on so rapidly in China. Uh, it, it's, it's beyond fascinating. And uh, I'll mention as well from a geopolitical point of view, uh, China has been beefing up its naval capabilities, uh, its, its, its military capabilities, and so forth. Now, I want to just give you a bit of a sense of how enormous this change in China has been and how enormous the impact has been on the rest of the world. Uh, consider the home ownership boom that China has experienced. They have gone from 0% household ownership to 60% household ownership in the space of less than 25 years. You remember the big uh, real estate crisis that America had? <laughs> Well, that, that started already when there was a home ownership rate about 65, and I think it went up to 69. But here you have the largest, most populous country in the world uh, go from zero to, to 60% in 25 years. It's phenomenal. It's, 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 it's never happened before in the history of mankind. 
Um, today, uh, the exports from China uh, account for more than a third of its economy. And in, uh, in just the space of 25 years, it used to be only 6%. Uh, these, are, these are trends and changes that are absolutely phenomenal. Um, China is just absolutely dominating uh, all the export markets here in North America. Anything that you can, you know, is shippable uh, and throw in a box, um, China will have, or some Southeast Asian or Asian country will have the majority market share uh, in, in those categories. And that's all happened, again, in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And that's incredibly short when you look at the long macro timelines. Here's a quick uh, glimpse so you can get a sense of just how big this impact has been on the rest of the world and everyone in this room. Um, consider, for example, uh, iron ore consumption. That's, I won't go through all of them, but 55% uh, of iron ore is consumed by China today. Um, remember, just 25 years ago, it was less than 2% of the world economy. Um, you look at any major commodity, oil or whatever else, China over the past number of decades has just dominated the consumption of which and it's related to some of the commodity prices that we're seeing here right now. What I'm trying to do here is just give you a sense of how enormous this change has been in China, and we want to ask some questions here in just a minute as to why, what's behind it. So the whole, um, the whole economic nexus point of the world has shifted back. China used to be the world's largest economy for 20-some centuries, at least, and then uh, 1800s sort of fell off the truck, so to speak, and uh, only recently is muscling its way back onto the world scene, certainly the economic scene. Uh, so the center of gravity um, of, of the world economy is now moving back in a very short space of time back to Asia. Now, why is China rising? What's behind all this? Um, basically, the main reason, and uh, Xi Jinping, who is the new general secretary of the Communist Party there, their express, his express goal and, and the communist express goal is that they want China to regain the grandeur and the might that they had previously. Uh, they want to do that by 2050. That's an overriding goal, and that's the way they want to go. Interestingly, a uh, paper here uh, written by, uh, seen by the Financial Times uh, out, out of Germany, and they expressed the comment that, um, and a warning in fact, that China seems driven by geopolitical rather than economic goals with potentially dire consequences for the European Union. The point here is, that I want to focus on, is China suddenly um, at one point decided that they want to rebuild their grandeur. Back in 1978, that's when it really started. Deng Xiaoping started some reforms, and it's really since 1978 that we've seen this rapid eruption of China in Southeast Asia on the world. Um, I won't spend much on this chart, but there's this verification of, if you look at the red line, how big China was going back to the 1500s, and uh, how, again, it's now coming back on the world scene. And in very short order, if things go on in the trends that we're seeing now, it'll be the biggest economy in the world. Now, uh, seven of the 10 largest shipping ports in the world are in Asia, so that gives China quite a bit of power, particularly as they're expanding their naval uh, might. And so there's a lot of choke points out there in, in uh, South Sea China and so forth. Uh, gives them a lot of power. And uh, it's part of this, uh, what I already mentioned, the one belt, one road. China has some very, very aggressive programs, spending programs, investment programs around the world. China is today the biggest global investor in world infrastructure, bigger than the U.S. There are building alliances all over the place, Africa, particularly in the Asian area, because their goal is to tie all these countries, particularly in Asia, uh, all together into one uh, group that, that uh, coordinates itself and uh, becomes together a challenge for the Western world. So that's a serious agenda that's underway. So the question then comes to everybody's mind then, of course, um, uh, what could be the potential consequences yet in the future? Asking questions such as, could China and other Asian nations dominate the world overtaking the US? Could that happen? Uh, they certainly have in some areas. They're not, our, their economy isn't as large yet, but uh, lots of economists are predicting that within 10 to 15 years at the outside. Could the Chinese currency now become the new world reserve currency? 
uh, American, the American dollar has been the reserve currency of the world for quite some time, certainly since before the Second World War. But that's the question on the lips of many people. Um, what role does East China have in end time geopolitics and prophecy? That's an interesting, we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that one here in just a second. And uh, are recent shifts in East Asia already prophetically significant or could they be as, uh, an event that uh, we can label as stage setting? So I wanna answer those questions. I'm gonna take uh, some risks on some of my opinions here. I'm gonna, my view is, and I call it an assertion, that the developments in East Asia that we're seeing today, not just China, but East Asia overall, do have prophetic significance. Um, and we're gonna, we're, we're not, I'll give you some reasons why, but firstly, you know, an uh, important marker for me, when I look at world trends uh, going back decades, centuries, um, if one sees developments that come on the scene, erupt on the scene, and happen rapidly, and if it's after 1948, and I picked 1948 because, of course, we know that uh, the, the uh, Jews were back in their land as of that point, and so anything that sort of happens in that window from 1948 on, not exclusively, but if we do see something, you know, you should get suspicious. Something's going on here, what's going on behind it? And if these things have a massive global impact and, um, you know, aren't, you know, I'll call it a mammon spirit or geopolitically driven uh, type of development, and as I already said, incredible and inexplicable, uh, as the case may be in, in uh, China, um, you really, you know, it's not, I think it's a reasonable presumption to say something's going on here Something this big must have significance and in some sense could be a stage setting development for other prophecies to unfold as the Bible tells us. Now I'm gonna take just a little bit of a detour here and pull in two other factors which are very interesting in the story of what's happened to China. It is interesting that uh, China had a number of diasporas starting in uh, 1909 through to 1945, uh, there, there were a number of periods of uprisings and political strife and uh, a number of groups and quite a large number of Chinese had to exit, especially as the communists took over uh, in the uh, late 1940s as they took uh, the one against the coup of Mintang. And so interestingly, already starting way back then, uh, these Chinese fanned out all over East and South Asia and the interesting thing that happened is that they became the commercial uh, the business people, even though they were the majority populations in places like Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, I can go list a whole bunch of them. Um, they're the majority, but they are the largest business owners. Almost like, uh, you know, some similarities to uh, the Jews in, in, in a number of respects here. So isn't it interesting that all these uh, all these Chinese were out there already fanning out over Asia as China became, again, stirred, you know, started growing, started um, coming back into the world scene. The fact that there were all these Chinese all around Asia already really enabled uh, the rapidity of the economic development of China. All these family groups worked with the mainland, Hong Kong, so on and so forth. Uh, it really, really helped uh, the expansion, the, the economic expansion that we saw in South Asia. Very interesting fact, uh, but it did have a role. And uh, again, it is part of this, you know, what I'm just seeing to be a phenomenal trend, hardly, um, hardly to be explained. Second fact I wanna throw in here out of interest is um, that uh, China does have some enormous demographic problems. They had, uh, um, as was the case also with some other Asian countries like South Korea, uh, they preferred to have, if, as you know, you could only have one child, up until recently anyway. Uh, that was the policy, you could only have one ch child uh, in uh, China. So uh, most households preferred to have a male. And uh, so what happened, unfortunately, is, uh, is this particular article here that I'm quoting shows is that a very large imbalance happened. A uh, lot more men there than there are women by a significant margin. And uh, so what could that, uh, what does that contribute? An interesting opinion, I'm gonna read the whole thing because I think it's quite significant that China, this being the largest, well, most populous country in the world, that it has such a gender imbalance. 
Throughout human history, young men have been responsible for the vast preponderance of crime and violence, especially single men in countries where status and social acceptance depend on being married and having children as it does in China and India. A rising population of frustrated single men spells trouble. Over the next generation, many of the problems associated with sex selection will get worse. Within 10 years, China faces the prospect of having the equivalent of the whole young male population of America, or almost twice that of Europe's three largest countries with little prospect of marriage, untethered to a home of their own and without the stake in society that marriage and children provide. Just, just consider um, the impact of that. Uh, South Korea also um, had a huge gender balance back in the early 1970s. Today, even, 10%, um, well, 10 or 11% of all marriages involve a foreign woman. And can you imagine what that impact would be if the, the China started doing that with that many single men? Um, if you're a polygamist, you don't want to church, you know, see church, uh, churches over there. <laughs> Right now. Um, but uh, what an imbalance. And uh, the, the interesting thing about it, the potential about it, is that uh, you're going to have all these single men around uh, for a number of decades yet who've got not a lot to do and uh, certainly could be, uh, you know, uh, as, this, as this quote from The Economist put out, um, could be up to no good, uh, certainly on the, on the, on the uh, international scene. So uh, what do I think about China? Is China going to overtake the world? Back to the questions that I posed earlier. Are they going to become the next reserve currency of the world? Are they going to become the most powerful country? I'm just going to give you my opinion as a secular analyst, a secular analyst perspective. I'm not saying I'm secular, but I'm just taking an economist perspective, if you will. Uh, Chinese, China's population is aging at the fastest rate ever. Already, their workforce is shrinking. So that's a really bad sign. Um, you know, by 2050, almost a fifth of their population will be over 65 years of age. That doesn't uh, allow for them to maintain a strong economy longer term. It's not going to hit them just yet, perhaps, but it's a, it's a, it's a negative factor for them longer term. Um, in a very quick order, just as they've quickly burst out of the world scene, they've taken on some of the bad habits of the Western world. They now have debt levels that are huge. It's incredible how quickly they've done that. So that's already a big negative. Um, they, uh, unfortunately, China, well, they have to feel, uh, feed, pardon me, almost a fifth of the world's population. They only have 7% of the world's arable land. Uh, so it's interesting that a country that large, which is that big of a trader, materials good trader around the world, doesn't have a lot of basic resources and uh, a big disadvantage there. And the bottom line is, is already intimated is there's just no way that what we've seen happening in China to date, again, in a, series, in a space of 25 to 40 years, becoming such a large, enormous country with such a big footprint economically around the world, it's, they can't repeat that. It's a one-time thing uh, that'll never happen again. Uh, they moved almost 300 million people from the countrysides and moved them into the um, uh, cities, large cities. And that's another thing that can't be repeated. So my answer is, uh, I think all the uh, worries are a little overrated, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have problems for quite some time. Um, and uh, but longer term, just looking at some of the problems that they have, you know, I wouldn't uh, get too carried away. But that's in the future. What does the Bible say? I think that's interesting. There's, a, there's not many verses in the Bible that give us any prophetic insight as to what's going to be going on in Asia, but there are one or two. I want to share those with you. The first one, we find that in Revelation 16, 12. reads, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So, uh, that seems pretty you know, easy to understand, literally. It talks here about the river Euphrates being dried up, and something happens that uh, the kings of the east go west. They go across that. And given that this is Revelation 16, probably sometime in the second half of the tribulation period, I don't think those kings of the east are bringing tidings of good joy. <laughs> um, so we don't know what's going to drive them to do that. But 
let's accept that that is a Bible reference that speaks about some things going on in the east, um, certainly east of the Euphrates. Now, uh, many take this next verse, Revelation 9, verses, rather, Revelation 9, 12 to 14, also as, as a significant verse that has some prophetic implications for Asia or parts of Asia. I, I personally um, don't. I think it's something probably more spiritual. Um, many try to f figure out where those 200 million um, mounted troops will come from. Uh, I, I basically end up leaving this one alone because uh, I just don't think I can make a strong enough case that that has direct prophetic implications that we can understand for, for, um, for economies or for China. Um, there is one other one uh, which I have up here next, and that's uh, Revelation 17:10. I think 17:10 and 17:12. I think here is an insightful perspective for us as to what happens to China and Asia longer term. So here we're dealing with, of course, uh, the section in Revelation which talks about the, um, the big beast with the seven heads and the ten horns and explains what that signifies. And it talks about uh, the seven kings here, five have fallen, one is, you know, the popular interpretation. I think in our circle would be that the, the one that is is still the Roman head and the other one has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. So this uh, next phase of world rulership uh, is still yet to come. And the next verse then links us in here into China. It says, the ten horns that you saw, however, ten horns are on the heads, I believe only one head, of the, um, of the beast. Here it talks about them and says... Um, are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. And I think that's an important key. So this being prophesied in John's day um, would mean that those future ten kings that he's seeing, that will come onto the scene for a very short period of time, have not yet had a kingdom in his day or prior. So what that means to me is that countries such as China, which existed before John gave these prophecies, uh, Persia, um, and others we could, we could posit, possibly Japan, they were around already before this prophecy was made. So if you use that key, it says that China will not be a significant component of the future global Ten King Coalition. Uh, and I think that uh, is important to know, but it does open up a lot of questions, doesn't it? Why, why is that going to happen? What is the implication for the rest of the world as that plays out? And I want to talk about that a bit as well. Okay, well, I've, oh, maybe it's going to come up next. There it is. There's that beast. Uh, I'm taking a little bit of license there quickly. And you'll see that the ten horns, um, we, we had made a little bit of a correction. I, I appreciate this artist, um, Mrs. Marvenko, Pat Marvenko, does a great job on these things. But unfortunately, uh, we had to change and put the ten horns on the one head. I think I can prove that, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, but in any case, what we're saying is China will not have a role in that Ten King Coalition uh, at that future date. Now, uh, interesting thing, uh, uh, just as an aside here, uh, one of the things that I've discovered over the years, um, especially having worked on this Ten King project, project and written a number of articles on it, looking at hordes of statistics from countries all around the world is uh, the interesting power of number 10. And uh, you give me, you know, pose any question to me or any, give me any indicator. And likely what you'll find is that the top 10 countries um, will be the majority. And I'll just illustrate. For example, um, the top 10 trading currencies uh, in the world, they account for over 90% of exchange around the world. So just 10 countries, there's, 100, there's 195 countries in the UN right now, probably 210, 220 countries and protectorates and so forth. So it only takes 10 um, to account for the majority. Here's another factor. This is the uh, distribution of arable land across countries around the world. The top 10 countries with the most arable land account for 57.6. So again, only 10 countries account for the majority in this particular indicator. I can keep going. Um, armed forces, the top 10, 
countries uh, in terms of armed forces again have over 50 percent um, population distribution around the world. It only takes the top 10 and you've got a majority. Um, I can go on, largest economies in the world, the top 10 biggest economies uh, account for 66.3% of the world economy. So isn't it interesting? It just takes 10. Uh, so that gives some credibility to this number 10 uh, that we know at some point, I'm talking here about the global uh, 10 king coalition, it uh, certainly will have enough power they only need 10 to uh, have enough power to dominate the world at that point in time. That was just a little diversion here, but I thought that's interesting, so I just was going to point it out to you. Well, uh, I'm going to now take a turn. I've talked about China. I hope you get the sense of the significance of what's happening in China and how it's going to play out. We're going to come back to a conclusion on that in a moment. But a, it is a phenomenal trend uh, and uh, something we shouldn't lose sight of and the potential implications thereof as well. Well, everybody knows there was a global financial crisis. My point of view is it still exists. It's just morphed into different forms all around the world. So we've had seven years of uh, fairly tough times internationally and uh, also to some extent in uh, North America. Big question, therefore, is what happens next? As the, you know, we've had seven thin years, uh, are we going to get seven good years? And I think the answer, and I'm going to tie this answer uh, into why we're going to see what we're seeing already and uh, we'll, we'll still expect to see in the monetary field. So I'll come back to that and tie this in. But my answer is no. Uh, we're living in a very, very different time. The, uh, the policymakers around are confused. They're making up policy as they go. They're groping. As I said already, they're desperate. It's a very, very different environment in the world, and I want to just mention quickly some of the reasons why that is and why they're going to continue to be confused and why they are taking some of these aggressive policy changes and monetary policies. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I'm going to name just seven things. One of the you know, big shibboleths of world outlook is continuing growth in trade. You know, that's been the big, big mantra now for uh, at least 100 years. Globalization. Keep trade growing. Well, the interesting thing is, for the first time now, for seven, eight years, almost, well, this particular case you showed a 10 year period, global growth, pardon me, global trade isn't uh, growing anymore. Surprise, surprise. This is confusing a lot of people. Debt. Well, you hear a lot about debt. One of the facts about debt and crises is crises periods never are over until debt levels have been brought down somewhat. Every single crisis ever studied and recorded to modern economic history going back 180 years. Every single crisis, such as the global financial crisis that have happened, first needed to see debt come down. Now that's happened to an extent in America, but it certainly has not happened worldwide. As I'm showing you here, the uh, world's up, uh, you know, these numbers are incredible, over 200 trillion. So that's another humdinger. Um, it's not going as, as per course as things should have been. We're seeing uh, productivity rates fall off. This is another one of those shibboleths of modern growth theory, right? You gotta have productivity growth. Truth is, we haven't had any great new technologies uh, for a long, long time, and uh, so that's another negative that's uh, confusing policymakers. Demographics, we talked about that in China, the fact that those populations are getting older, that's also true for the entire world, on average. And uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, that means that uh, world economies are gonna lumber they're, they're going to be under strain. Uh, they're going to be growing slower. Um, we have also an extreme um, uh, uh, distribution of wealth in the world. It's becoming much, much worse. As you can see here, that's the Gini coefficient. The higher it goes, it means the more inequitable is the um, spread of wealth. So that's, uh, you know, I would even venture the opinion that we have a wealth view today that's probably worse than or equal to the worst days in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. It's a very bad problem. It's a very bad problem, and part of it is a cause uh, of the low interest rates. And that's the chart I'll show you next. Um, you all have probably you know, will know that interest rates have fallen, but they have fallen to 500-year lows. And some, I saw one economist make the case that it was a 5,000-year low. Uh, but rates are incredibly low. And uh, you know why is that? It's absolutely terrible for the retirement classes. Um, if you thought you could retire on 4% interest rate uh, a number of years ago, well, you're going to have to save four times as much money. 
uh, to have this, you know, enjoy the same lifestyle. So it's, it's a very terrible thing, but you don't hear economists talk about that. They talk about inflation. Oh no, there's no inflation. Retirement income has had a huge inflation, but they, they don't look at it that way. Um, quick point I want to make here about central banks. Seventh point why the world economy is not going to rebound as normally would have been the case after past crises and why uh, countries and policymakers are going to strain and try to keep things going or hold things together um, is, is this particular chart I want to show you here. And I think you all know that central banks have been very, very active. Unprecedented policies they've taken on trying to get economies to go again. And interesting parallel here with the Second World War, you know that uh, central banks have been in a similar position before. At the end of the Second World War, central banks were trying to help the you know, war effort and they bought government bonds and they really got over indebted to the point as you can see, as we're seeing here recently again, as central banks recently have um, borrowed money, um, bought, you know, I won't get into all the technicalities, but the central bank's balance sheets are way, way over levered. Um, it's to the, to the point of the same level that we had in the Second World War. What's different this time is it's a financial war, not a military war. The solutions to the debt problem that the central banks, the world central banks had at that point back in the 1940s came naturally. All the soldiers came home from the war, they started families, all the technologies that were developed during that wartime period were then put to work in the peacetime economy. You had booming households. It was only 10, 15 years the whole thing sorted out. Growth roared away and uh, that debt disappeared. This time we have, we do not have that possibility. This is not, th this debt increase is a function of a financial war and not a military war. And unfortunately that has some dire consequences longer term. Well, so what we have among central bankers around the world is a war. Uh, they're fighting each other. I think we're coming up to the 900th interest rate cut of the last seven years. They're fighting to uh, try to get their currency to be weaker than the next country so they can get more trade and so forth. It's, it's a real free-for-all out there. And, uh, uh, and the central banks are jumping in there as well, uh, as already mentioned. I'd love to get into the technicalities, but we don't want to get lost in that. The point is the central banks are uh, uh, basically creating assets out of thin air. Now the problem is that uh, it's not working that well. Even though interest rates are as low as they are, and some of these central banks around the world, like the Bank of Japan, I mean, they're, they're, they're basically completely funding their budget deficits out of paper, they're just creating it, and buying all the government bonds in. That's also the case now for Europe for the next number of years. European Central Bank will be buying up more bonds than uh, governments will be issuing over the next couple of years. All fabricated money. Unfortunately, it hasn't had a big impact yet. Um, so, I mean, last year I had the opportunity to give you some more uh, insights as to the changes in philosophy. So I'm not going to go over that again, I'll just talk about some new things. The latest policy solution that uh, central bankers are coming up with, this idea of negative interest rates. Um, how would you feel to have the privilege to uh, deposit your money in the bank and uh, pay the bank uh, a fee? In other words, they wouldn't pay you an interest rate, uh, they'd charge you an interest rate to, to hold it. Now that sounds strange, doesn't it? Uh, but that's the case already in quite a number of countries around the world. Switzerland has a negative overnight deposit rate of 0.7%. Uh, Switzerland and the European Central Bank just moved up to a negative 0.3. I can go on. Uh, you will literally be charged by the bank if you deposit money there. And the idea is here uh, from the policymakers that if we can make it negative, we can make it so terribly um, difficult for people to not spend because they want people to spend, take on debt, get aggressive, grow economies that way. Of course, that's not a foundation that's very good for long-term stability, but that's the latest idea. This particular individual, Andrew Haldane, Bank of England, um, says this is a radical and durable option, a government bank electronic wallet. It would allow negative interest rates to be levied on currency easily and speedily. There's other guys like uh, Lord Adair Turner, another Brit, um, who, you know, is, pushing very hard, and there's a large number of economists that agree with them. They, they just want to credit uh, money directly to every household, just give money to central uh, to governments. Uh, and one thing for sure, if you give money to governments, they're going to spend it. 
Uh, so that probably will be working. But these are the kinds of ideas that are going on. These guys think they're brilliant. And these are just immoral policies. They really are. And they're going to bring some very, very bad, 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 uh, have some very bad uh, results for us, uh, the world overall. So uh, just to conclude here, um, creating money out of thin air, they're arguing that we should have a cashless society simply because if you have to go the route of having negative interest rates as a policy, then everybody's going to be better off taking their money, stuff it in the pillow. So but they don't want you to do that. They want you to be part of the financial system. So policymakers you know, are already arguing that we have to go to a cashless society just so we can support the policy of negative interest rates. So that's the world we're in. Uh, these, are, these are desperate solutions. They're immoral. Of course, they would regard them to be amoral, but they're immoral because they caused huge, huge wealth transfers. Uh, and we're seeing it right before our eyes. And uh, I wish I had more time to, ex uh, to, to explain it to you. So I, I've, I've talked about a couple of current events, themes, uh, you know, not really gone into a whole lot of uh, details, I should say. But these are times of significant change. It's, it's uh, I, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, can't believe uh, some of these policies that are being uh, uh, being recommended and put in place around the world because uh, they aren't going to be a good solution at all. Uh, this wealth skew that I talked about earlier already being that extreme, it's only going to get more extreme. Uh, because these kinds of policies they disenfranchise large parts of the population. What's different also about these trends that I've been talking about? They're global this time. It's not like central banks haven't been in problems like this over the last three, four, five hundred years. What's different today, as I often point out, these are global phenomena. Last year I pointed out that uh, central banking itself, we only had 14 central banks uh, in, in the year 1900. And uh, we have 100 and 80 central banks today. They're all into the same money system, all coordinated, and uh, certainly fits in with uh, what we know will happen in the tribulation period. Revelation 13, uh, the verses 16, 17 talks about a world where uh, the, the, I call them the last financial guru, the false prophet, uh, will put in place that uh, new monetary system where uh, you have to take the sign before you can buy and sell. So we're well on the road to that. Okay, I'm going to tie up a couple things here. Uh, back to China. Um, no, uh, I, I think the Bible tells us that uh, as much as China is going to make a lot of waves yet in the future, and there's going to be a lot of geopolitical shifts, uh, China does not gain a final role as a world hegemon. Uh, we can speculate here, and I will in a minute, as to what possibly could happen. We can ask the question, what conditions and catalysts uh, would cause the kings of the East to go west across the Euphrates? I don't know, but could it be a big economic battle? Could it be a geopolitical battle? Could it be, we don't know. Do the 10 kings come on the scene and start muscling around and uh, we get a disenfranchised kings of the East who you know, pick up their stakes and, and, and uh, head west? We don't know. Um, it could very well be that uh, the Global Ten King Coalition, um, think about that for a moment. Why would 10 countries come together? I personally believe those kings are countries. Why, why would 10 come together if uh, one superpower couldn't do the job? Today we're still living in a world that we have a superpower, that being America. You don't need 10 kings because this one superpower is stronger than any 10 kings right now. But what we know, the Bible tells us, a 10 King Coalition does come for a very short time what are the conditions that cause that, uh, those to come together? Is it possibly a you know, competitive situation that arises with the King of the East? We don't know. What we can conclude is that uh, the next decades, years, we don't know how far in the future, you can be sure there's going to be a lot of geopolitical tumult. We haven't seen anything yet. And again, you can ask the question for America. Uh, where is America in this scenario? And uh, if, if America indeed was to be was to continue to be the world superpower is it going to be part of that 10 kings or is it because it may not be on the scene a lot of speculative questions but I think there's some very interesting ones begging for uh, what America's role would be now uh, what uh, one will run into a lot and I get a lot of emails uh, from uh, our readers of uh, eternal value review and uh, you know it's hard not to run into doomsters who will put fear into everyone about certain c 
crash scenarios and the dollar, US dollar is gonna collapse and all the rest of it. Um, what to do about that? And um, myself, I, as you know, I happen to live in Canada. Uh, I've always worked globally. My perspectives have always been oriented globally, so I, I might see things a little differently than others do. Whereas I think yourselves, as citizens here in the United States, that look around and say, my gosh, things are deteriorating. They are. But, um, you know, for somebody like myself, who's looking at things in a global relative plane, I'm only speaking here from an economic point of view, not a moral one. Um, America is, is, I call it, sort of the best neighbor, you know, the best uh, house in the bad lot. Things are just worse elsewhere. So yes, what you're seeing here, in terms of monetary conditions, debt levels, I uh, can go on and on, list all kinds of things. Yes, they're deteriorating, there's no question about it from an absolute point of view. But looked at internationally, um, America is viewed as still a safe haven. You know, uh, if, if you're living over in, uh, let's say, Europe right now, and, uh, or Japan, and the bank is offering you minus 0.3%, um, and you have these huge economic dislocations going on in Europe and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it looks very dire longer term. America doesn't look so bad. Now I'm not doing, I'm not recommending that uh, you make any investment decisions on that, but I'm just trying to give you that perspective. You really do need to look at things globally, see things how play out. So back to the question here, is, there, is a big crash imminent? Again, I get that question all the time. And my answer to, to people is, uh, the entire history of mankind has been pockmarked by financial crises. It's just a fact of the human economy, human financial system. The global financial crisis we've seen, yes, it's been one of the worst in a long, long time. Uh, possibly it is one of the worst, but um, it's not that extraordinary. Um, these will continue. In fact, we could, you know, things, we could have a crisis period next year. There's lots of things that can trigger it. Uh, it's hardly worth trying to uh, predict it. But I'm just saying it's part of the human condition, it's part of the financial system. And um, yes, the world <coughs> will see a financial collapse someday. The Bible tells us um, when it will happen. Yes, definitely it will happen in the tribulation period. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's a real question, it will happen. But remember that uh, Satan needs crises. It's crises that uh, bring the conditions, that uh, create the consensus to, for policymakers to get together to bring in these crazy policies, to, you know, worse monetary policies, all that kind of thing, uh, to get them to change things. It takes crises often to get these, the, these consensus points to thrust through. And so we'll get more of them. And uh, I don't know how many, but it's not the big crash. So don't let people scare you into this big crash happening. Uh, Satan needs a functioning financial system. And in fact, we're in an environment and uh, certainly that's the characteristic uh, of Satan, uh, is uh, deception. Massive deception and corruption going on right now, certainly in my view. And uh, in those kinds of environments, you have to be very, very careful. There is nothing, uh, let me put it this way, it's very possible that some of the policies that I talked about, certainly the infrastructure spending policies that China has and other countries are wanting to initiate, it's very possible that we could still have another economic boom. I'm not necessarily predicting it, but I'm saying it's very possible and it fits in with the storyline of the last days. People are going to be lured in to the good things as in the days of Noah. And even though everything is crumbling underneath, it's the apparent perceptions that are false and deceptive uh, will continue to lure many people in, including Christians. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, that just because things look rosier for a while doesn't mean things are necessarily getting better. The underlying condition and the long-term trajectory where this is all going hasn't changed. Um, this is uh, the last book I wrote. I think it was five or six years ago. You will all know what's in it because I get, we gave it away as a free one here, I think, five or six years ago. But that's what that book focuses on, um, you know, how these things play out into the tribulation period and explains all the contributing trends. Uh, that book uh, probably has the most Bible quotes of any economic book that you'll probably run across. Okay, I want to cut to the close here. And I want to deal with some, uh, you know, more human personal issues. 
And um, the, the world looks at financial markets, economic policy, monetary policy as its salvation, economic salvation, if you will. And um, so mankind's putting this onus, this hope, on these systems of mankind. And uh, so in effect, uh, we're, we're putting a lot of faith in idols. And the Bible has a really, I, I, I love the uh, definition of an idol that the Bible takes. It's, it's quite hilarious, but it's so true. I'm gonna quote a couple of verses here. Uh, here is Isaiah 40, verses 19 through 20. As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with golden fashions, silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. So focus on that. The idol, they're looking for something that will not topple. Here's another one, Isaiah 41, verses 7. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. Again, uh, there's a number of verses. I'll give you one more. Here again, uh, this one out of uh, Jeremiah 10, verses 3 to 4. They cut a tree out of the forest, and, and uh, I think something got, got lost here, a craftsman. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails it so it will not totter. So isn't that fascinating? Um, the, the allegation here that prophets make uh, against these idols is that they are mankind's fabrications, and mankind it themselves has to nail it down. You've got to keep you know, propping it up. Uh, and that's definitely what's happening uh, in terms of monetary policies and economic policies around the world. This, these idols keep toppling. They keep falling. And uh, so they've got to run and uh, keep propping them up with these new policies and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we're, we're seeing here right now. And uh, that will continue to be the, the great disappointment. Uh, so mankind worships what must be propped up. And, uh, you know, in some applications, inflated by mankind. But again, it's a, a lot of deception in behind that. So the Bible is very clear um, about what it thinks of the kinds of monetary policies, the moral policies that I've talked about in brief. And uh, definitively, uh, the, the Bible um, um, you know, has some very strong statements about it. For example, Micah 6, 11, shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? There is, I think, I can count eight or nine verses in the Bible that talk about uh, the way scales being tampered with. Here's another one. When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? Skimping on the measure, boosting the price and cheating with dishonest guilt. That's what modern day monetary policies embrace. It may seem so sophisticated and modern and it's hard to see through the smoke, but that's what it is. They're rigged scales and uh, God um, condemns that. And as um, um, Ezekiel, well Zechariah at this point uh, tells us, uh, it's wicked. It's the iniquity of the people throughout the land and uh, will be judged by mankind. And as I was pointing out, that's what happens later on in the tribulation period after the uh, false prophet has tried to give it one last attempt to prop things up uh, with that new buy-sell policy. Uh, eventually, uh, it all gets uh, destroyed and collapsed before we go on to the millennial period. But we're not there yet, we're, you know, we're, but we're seeing all these strains and common threads working through the whole superstructure of what's happening in the world. Um, Again, I presented a lot of that superstructure detail last year, and um, you'd have to go look at that DVD to get that. So uh, why is this all happening? Uh, we're just coming to the close here. Let's read some verses here. Having the understanding of darkened, uh, pardon me, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the hardening of their hearts. And that's so much of the story today. You know, many people will look at um, the ridiculousness, hopelessness of some of the policies that are brought in. But you know what? People want to believe. That's certainly what I see in financial markets around the world. People are worried. They feel desperate. I'm talking about professionals here, not necessarily uh, non-financial professionals. 
they want to they want to believe and they'll play ball and so what th that's why this can continue a lot longer than we may believe it's very hard to predict but that's the point they don't want to believe god that is they have their understanding darkened but they do want to believe in their own idols and will continue to try to prop them up one last verse and i want to come right back to china from the beginning and uh, this is a lovely verse to ch uh, close on um, you know it sort of parallels the message that uh, Joel Rosenberg gave yesterday, that uh, we, despite what we believe from a, um, a biblical point of view, uh, theology point of view, we still need to love everybody, uh, even our enemies. And here, interestingly, look what happens to China. Although China, uh, as, as we already talked about, could be a loose cannon, could be a geopolitical issue here for quite a number of years, perhaps decades, be a bit of a troublemaker. Um, I can't be specific on it. Look what happens to China in the end. And uh, here we see a verse from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 12. Behold, and now this is talking about the millennial period, uh, early millennial period. Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and those from the land of Sinem. Uh, so Sinem, you know, Sin being the, basically Arabic for China. Um, even the Chinese uh, will worship the Lord and, and become, a, uh, be, become a believing nation at the start of the millennial period. Thank you very much. That's it. Okay, we're going to have a 10 minute break and then Bill will be here to uh, talk about politics and geopolitical stuff.